Good afternoon, everyone. For those of you who've been with us all day long, this is that session where we're going to really start that countdown to 2030 to that zero hunger sustainable development goal. And the call to action, we've been hearing from speakers all day long, but now we're going to really focus on that at the local and the global level. I want to take this opportunity again to thank our program partners, the World Affairs Council of America and the World Food Program USA, but also to remind people that we're able to do this at a global level for free for everybody on the planet. There have been hundreds and hundreds of people today on, um, but it's partly because we're able to call on our local community support. And there were some very special sponsors today, Hormel Foods and King Solution, McKnight Foundation, Regenerative Agriculture Foundation, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, Greater MSP, but we also rely on our members, all of you watching who are our members already, individuals, companies, agencies, nonprofits, thank you. Your annual contributions are what make this really happen. Uh, some of our um, larger uh, contributors, some of our companies and foundation, the Carlson Family Foundation, Delta, Cargill, Horton, Medtronic, United Health Group, Ecolab, Land of Lake, Sid Investment, your important support. We appreciate, we thank you. And for all of you who are members, of course, thank you again. And for those of you watching who aren't members and would like to join this community, this family, Global Minnesota, please uh, check us out, go to the website. There's an opportunity because somebody is matching your gift today and that will be a great benefit and help to us. So check it out and do it. Today's panel is being chaired by Liz Schreyer, uh, president of the US Global Leadership Council. And I want to say that I have not met anybody in my 25 years of working in Washington and in Minnesota who has touched and influenced and changed the hearts and minds of so many policymakers about the issues we've been talking about all day long. Nobody has done it like this. 25 years ago, she created the national organization to get all of us, and we could use the analogy, you know, the, the cats that couldn't be gathered together. She was able to pull all the people who cared about how our nation's foreign policy, especially our foreign assistance and foreign development aid policy was being managed, getting us all on the same page. And this morning you heard Governor Beasley sort of remark, and I was kind of amazed that in Congress, and he used the phrase both ends of Pennsylvania Avenue, there was a consensus, a bipartisan consensus that this was a key to US leadership and that there was a support for this that was deep and was genuine and was authentic. And nobody has made that happen like Liz Schreyer. She's famous for lots of things, but sometimes people put some quotes in her mouth that come from people that she has helped to get be part of it. But my favorite one is the one from one of the generals who've been a very strong support of USGLC. There's a whole smart power, very large part of it, who said to a member of Congress someplace, you can fund the State Department adequately or you can give me more bullets. Liz has never stopped making it clear that we need to take our global leadership position seriously because it's not just good for the planet, but it's good for us. And today joining us uh, with her, our mayors of our big cities, um, our, our one of our leaders from Cargill from the foundation, Michelle Grock. Uh, Liz, you have the opportunity and we are counting on you to take us into that call to action Thank you so much for being with us today. Welcome to World Food Day 2020 here in Minnesota.
Thank you, Mark. Uh, I, I love the introduction other than I don't think I gave Jim Mattis that quote. He did that all on his own. But congratulations to you and the entire global Minnesota team for what has been looks like an incredible summit and what a way to acknowledge World Food Day on its 75th anniversary. So this has been an amazing program, rich in content and vision already. And frankly, how could it not be when you start off with a keynote from my dear friend, Governor David Beasley of the World Food Program. And I have to say it brought back memories of the very first um, time I flew on a World Food Program plane. I don't know if any of the rest of you had, but I was flying on a to a very small village in Tanzania to actually see a food nutrition program. And a member of my delegation was actually a business exec from General Mills, just uh, down the street from where we, we where most of you probably are in in Minneapolis. Literally had to hold my hand because it was this tiny plane, looked like it was probably built in World War one little white bubble with blue writing and I was scared out of my mind but when I arrived all the fears dissipated and I was inspired because of the people that I met in these groups of small shareholder farmers these women that were just joyful in sharing their story they had newborns literally strapped on their back as they were fielding the land that we were on that couldn't be much bigger than, than the room that I'm in in my home. And through their interpreters, they tell me about how their babies were so sick, their newborns losing weight until, as they said, America came. And who was America? The World Food Program, USAID, actually Land Lakes and CARE, who were partnering in this program that taught them how to take orange potatoes instead of white potatoes to give them the nutritional value to help their babies grow, teach them how to diversify their crops to bring them to market. And then a mother grabbed my hand and thanked me, according to the interpreter, to say, thank you for giving me a hand up and instead of just a handout. So I am so honored to be here. And I never again was afraid to get on a World Food Program plane because it is just a reminder of just what I'm sure you talked about today of the remarkable recognition that the Nobel Peace Prize was given to an organization fighting global hunger partnering with Cargill, who was right there to match the Nobel Peace Prize. And what a way to show remarkable leadership and exactly what we're going to talk about for the next hour of partnerships with business, government, and local leadership, and a way to celebrate World Food Day and to take the conversation to Countdown to 2030, a call to action. With a particular lens, Mark, as you have asked me to do, through this lens of the sustainable development goal number two, what will it take for all of us on this, on this, in, in this Zoom room to talk about how we get to zero hunger in the world? What can each of us do? We have a remarkable panel of experts to help us think through this. And I wanna say one more word about why I am glad to be here today. I spend a lot of time on the road, lately it's virtual, hosting town hall conversations with members of Congress to ask the question, why does leading globally matter locally? Why, why does it matter that we focus on SDG number two in any of these conversations. I was just in literally Idaho virtually an hour ago. And the issue of global hunger is central to this question, because what I find is Americans really care that we live in this stable, secure, healthier, and less hungry world. And so what one of the reasons I want to be here is there's something really special about the DNA of the global citizenry of, of Minnesota. You know, Cargill, you lead our Heartland initiative that Michelle will talk about. Beth Ford, the CEO of Lando Lakes, is, is the board officer of my organization, US Global Leadership Coalition. Uh, Senator Norm, Col Norm Coleman is our co-chair. I just last week did a program where Senator Klobuchar and Representative Tom Emmer, who probably don't agree on much, both were singing off the same song sheet about this very issue. And we're gonna hear in just a moment that your mayors get it. So there, if we're gonna do, do uh, this call to action, get SDG number two, 
turned around because we know global hunger is no longer on the decline, that it is this Minnesota spirit that is gonna do the trick. So let me introduce our all-star guests who are gonna help figure out how to turn that corner. First up is our two, your two mayors, who you all know well. They were both elected in 2017, and they have worked tirelessly for your communities, especially over the last seven months, to deal with both the social unrest, the civil unrest, as well as responding to COVID. Leaders in food and agricultural issues, food security and delivering with their constituents, for their constituents. And so proud, I know both of them will talk about it, to help launch M Bold today. Welcome, I already see Mayor Fry, and welcome to Mayor Carter. I think he's somewhere, we'll see him shortly pop up. And joining as well is Michelle Grog, Cargill's Vice President for Corporate Responsibility. So welcome to all three. I don't yet see Mayor Carter, but he will join us shortly. We'll have to get your uh, camera on, but soon enough. All right, well, welcome, let's get started. I'll start with Michelle and Mayor Fry and Mayor Carter will join us as well. So. I'm going to do a round of questions and then we'll take your questions. You can put them in the chat room. And Michelle, uh, Mayor Fry, let's start with kind of getting a lay of the land. And sadly, as I know we've been talking about today, is the decline in the fight against global hunger, even before COVID, was going in the wrong direction. The first email I got in my inbox this morning was from a friend at the UN who said the food needs may increase in the world 82% from pre-pandemic levels. So we're not on track to get to where we need to be. So Michelle, I'm gonna start with you. The business community has stepped up in real significant ways. Your, your generosity uh, for matching WFP is, is one particular way, but you've been in this before COVID-19. One of the things that I'm struck with is you're one of the earliest innovators in these public-private partnerships on nutrition and food security. You've partnered with USAID, you've partnered, as I said, with World Food Program. My question is why? Why is the business community invested in sustainable development? And I'm gonna add one that I often get. Well, why doesn't the business just do it all? Why, why does government need to be involved? Michelle, all yours. Thank you so much, Liz. It's such a pleasure to be here with you and thanks for all the leadership that USGLC is providing to shine a spotlight on these issues, certainly um, here at home in the United States, but also around the world. And so my, my, my thanks to you and for participating today. And of course, it's such an honor to be here with Mayor Fry and Mayor Carter. We've had a pretty extraordinary year around the world, but um, even more so here in the Twin Cities. And these two gentlemen have provided extraordinary leadership. And so really, really grateful for that. So to your question about why, um, at Cargill, um, our purpose is to nourish the world in a safe, responsible, and sustainable way. It's who we are, it's why we exist. And so that's really why. That's really why we're engaging in sustainable development. We are, um, we're focused on World Food Day, and for us, World Food Day is every day because Cargill businesses work every day around the world to get food where it's needed. Um, and so it's the focus of our businesses and, and what it is that we do every day. And we know that as we look to the future, food systems have to be more sustainable, more resilient, and more equitable. And so at Cargill, we have both the opportunity and the responsibility um, to engage in efforts that help provide access to safe, nutritious food, to innovate, um, improve the nutritional offerings that we have for, for customers and for our consumers, and to support good, good nutrition within our own workforce and in our communities. And so that's a big responsibility, that's a lot. We cannot do it alone. And so we have to have governments that are supporting good policies, creating that enabling environment in which we can run our businesses and where, where employees can, can live and work. We need donors, you talked about USAID. They help us in these partnerships that we have to scale efforts and make sure that they're sustainable. We need nonprofit organizations, civil society, NGOs. They're doing the hard work on the ground. And you talked about the recognition of the World Food Program. That is absolutely a tribute to the work that those people are doing every day on the ground in some of the hardest, hardest places. And so we talk about today we're focused on SDG2, but at Cargill, while we're focused on that every day, we think unless we address SDG 17, which is about partnerships, mm -hmm. we actually, we can't do the rest. And so we have to do this work in partnership 
across all sectors in order to really make a difference. We have some great partnerships right here at home. Um, Mayor Fry, Mayor Carter will know work that's being done by Second Harvest Heartland right here. Um, as the issues around COVID continue to persist, companies, including Cargill, turned their kitchens at their headquarters into community kitchens. And we were able to provide meals across the state. I think at one time we were doing 5,000 meals a week um, out, out of our corporate kitchen. Globally, we're working with organizations like Heifer International and an initiative we call Hatching Hope, where we will reach 100 million people and improve the production and consumption of poultry. So there's a whole range of, of, of partnerships and examples. And we have a responsibility to bring the expertise and the skills that we have to bear and yes, resources, um, but we need others in order to make it happen. So that's why we're involved in sustainable Great. development. Well, I wanna come back to, to some specific questions, but let me get the mayors involved and start with you, Mayor Fry. You know, speaking, there's no one on the front line quite like both you. Welcome, Mayor Carter. Um, so let me ask both of you this question. You know, when I think of front lines, what you've been having to deal with in terms of food insecurity, um, mayors and local leaders all over the world. I saw some local headlines over the summer that literally said, depression era hunger accelerated by global pandemic. You know this well. And I am so impressed watching mayors literally rise to the challenge. But I also want to give you credit for mayors speaking out on the topic we're talking about, about why leading globally matters locally. And I want our audience to know that the US Conference of Mayors passed this impressive re uh, resolution recently, reinforcing the importance of America's role in the world. And the resolution called for investing in exactly what Michelle just said, State Department, USAID, and, and to let our viewers know, it underscored the role that sub-national actors, including US, uh, uh, cities uh, need to take to measure their own progress on sustainable development goals. So congratulations to you. My question is, how do you see the connection between local and global hunger? Why is it important that America should be at the front line of this question we're talking about, the goal of zero hunger by 2030 locally and globally? Mayor Fry, why don't you begin? Thank you so much, uh, Liz uh, and Michelle and, and Mark, uh, for all of your passion. Uh, and Mayor Carter, it's been an honor, of course, to work with you on this very topic. And you're right, mayors are very much on the front lines. And those front lines have gotten all the more difficult over the last nine or so months uh, since the beginning of, of COVID-19. It's, it's not like we didn't already have a hunger crisis. It's not like we didn't already have issues with housing stability uh, and food deserts, but those issues are all the more pronounced and significant uh, when you have this kind of global pandemic that leads to an epidemic of food insecurity that we're seeing right now in our Twin Cities in, in Minneapolis and St. Paul, and, and we're really seeing around the, around the world. Um, and early in my term, uh, as mayor, uh, I signed on to the very agreement that you were talking about through the U.S. Conference of Mayors, which was the Milan Urban Food Policy Pact, where 100 mayors joined forces and really committed to developing some deep and sustainable, fair, inclusive, climate-friendly, and resilient urban food systems. And, uh, you know, now looking back on it, you know, I, it, can, it almost seems like it was uh, sort of prophetic work, um, because now many years into the pact, uh, we we collectively face these insecurities that in many cases are far more significant than one that when the, what the PAC was uh, originally created. Um, and it's those foundational elements that we really find mayors around the world and, and, and in our twin cities, we're, we're very much on the front lines. Um, and so, you know, that, that work needs to happen at a local level because you know, people need to know where they're going to get their food. They need to have access to a grocery store. They need to have access to, to healthy, uh, locally grown in many cases, uh, foods that, that it, depending on which neighborhood you're in, you might not necessarily have, have access to. Um, and you know, I'll be honest, it's been a, a tough summer. Um, and as we've seen these needs for free food and household and personal supplies skyrocket, it's, it's really heartbreaking to see families sometimes standing in line for hours in, in the summer heat or, or in you know, chilly fall, 
during this pandemic just to get the necessary supplies they need, inclusive of food, includes diapers and groceries. And that's just to get through the next week. And so, you know, in Minneapolis, we, we, we were, we're putting in additional monies. Uh, we've got a proposal moving forward right now to put in another half million dollars towards tackling this very issue and making sure that, that food shelves and those that are on even more on the front lines have the necessary recipe for success to not just get through the fall, but get through the winter when you can't necessarily have these, these longer lines of people standing outside in, in freezing temperatures. Um, and we're adapting. And I think that's been one of the most exciting pieces about all of this is the, the, this creativity and this grit that you see within our local food systems that's really paid the way. I mean, we've seen distilleries that have converted uh, and pivoted towards making hand sanitizer and, and, and emergency food distributions. We've seen chefs and restaurateurs who, who can't operate in their traditional fashion during COVID-19, giving meals to, to seniors and those who are less fortunate. Uh, we have seen farmers, uh, you know, to families with, with food box programs, making sure to connect with their local farmers throughout Minneapolis public schools. And, and, and we've seen communities of faith, uh, many, many different churches and, and, and synagogues and mosques throughout our city really step up in a big way. And, and I think that's the part that's heartwarming. Um, so all this, hack, it's not done in a vacuum. We have to do it as part of a, a global partners. And, you know, you, you mentioned the, the global citizenry of Minnesota, you know, and that is a mentality that I think that so many of us share. Um, and, and I know that the, the Mayor Carter and I have that same, that same vision because we're not operating in a vacuum and, and you know, this is, we're experiencing the very same issues on either side of the river. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mayor Carter. Yeah, thank you very much. I really appreciate that. I, I learned a lot listening to Mayor Fry, as I always do. Uh, I'm parenting as we speak right now, so I was uh, planning on uh, opening up the camera after uh, after after Mayor Fry's opening comment. So thanks for uh, being patient with me as I join. Not a problem. This is this is a unique moment <laughs> for all It's of very us. much a unique moment. Yes, we are are constantly negotiating with kids to do distance learning and uh, everything else. We're but, honored to have you here. Well, it's it's an honor to be here because to the point of this conversation. Uh, we have people in our community who are worried about food right now uh, who have just never had to worry about food before, who have absolutely no experience worrying about food before. You know, we have families who, professional families, you know, uh, families with professional careers and, you know, college degrees uh, who are concerned about their ability to feed their children. Um, and that is a, a shock. It, it's shocking for us. Uh, it's unusual for us. Uh, and I think it is one of the most alarming signs of this moment. We know that uh, we're facing a pandemic. Uh, we know that we're facing an economic reality that is different than anything that any of us are used to. In St. Paul, that means in a city of 315,000 people, uh, we've seen uh, over 80,000 uh, unemployment applications since March 15th alone. Uh, it means that uh, as we have you know, manage and try to work with our population of, of residents who have experienced unsheltered homelessness. Uh, that population is literally more than 10 times larger today uh, than it was just a year ago. Uh, and so I think uh, Global Food Day uh, or World Food Day comes at a good time for us uh, and an important time for us when, you know, we're really focused on uh, things that simple, you know, as, as literally as food. Uh, food for our families, food for our young people, food for our children. Uh, we have seen uh, enormous food operations go into play uh, in the last six months. The type of things, frankly, uh, that we're used to seeing abroad that we're not used to seeing as necessary in the United States, uh, as uh, my daughter agrees with me. Uh, as we you know, saw restaurants shut down this spring, I'll tell you one of the things that it was really heartwarming for me is, you know, in those moments when, you know, executive orders went out and restaurants had to uh, shut down completely or go to very limited capacity. Uh, I had a couple restaurateurs here in St. Paul who would call me uh, and I would assume they were going to call me angry or trying to figure out what are we supposed to do. Uh, and uh, to a person, they all said, look, we want to make sure this food doesn't go bad. How do we make sure that we get it to people who are experiencing homelessness or families who are in crisis or something like that? Uh, and that was really kind of profound and heartwarming to me. We've seen our schools uh, deliver food. We've seen rec leaders, people who signed up to work for a recreation center, uh, whose job over the past few months has been delivering food to families in need. Again, 
that's not something that we're, we're really used to. It's making us rethink our relationship uh, with food and with hunger, even right here in St. Paul, in ways that we're used to seeing on infomercials, frankly, but not like seeing ourselves in, you know, not seeing ourselves reflected in. Um, I think it also, as we think about the nexus of this crisis, and, you know, I keep telling folks, you know, crisis is an understatement. We're, we're a world in crises right now. Uh, whether that's the pandemic crisis, uh, unemployment crisis, uh, hunger crisis, uh, uh, homelessness crisis, and certainly our continuing uh, climate crisis, uh, those things kind of overlap for us and hopefully make us literally go down that road, continue to go down that road. The intriguing thing about World Food Day for me, for St. Paul, is we always talk about St. Paul uh, and in Minneapolis as well uh, as a place where you can travel the world on a plate. Uh, we right. literally have mm -hmm. the world's food here right there. Uh, in the Twin Cities metropolitan area. You know, you can go down uh, Eat Street or you can go down University Avenue. We have all kinds of different places. Uh, right here in St. Paul, we have Little Africa and District Del Sol uh, and Monk Market or, or Monk Village and Monk Town Market. You know, we have all of these different spaces, uh, 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 Little Mekong, uh, where you can go and literally travel the world on a plate. So one of our focuses as we move forward is going to be thinking, how do we uh, connect our food systems. Uh, we talk a lot about like food deserts uh, as places, uh, and I think a lot of people think of a food desert as a place that doesn't have a cub or, or doesn't have a, you know, a super target. Uh, when in the meantime, we have an enormous amount of uh, ethnic grocery stores. Uh, we have an enormous amount of, you know, community gardens. Uh, we have an enormous amount of uh, farmers markets all throughout our community and our ability to close the loop uh, or to link all of those uh, things together to create our own uh, urban uh, localized uh, food source, uh, I think it's gonna be critical both as we continue to source the need that exists right now in this acute moment, but as we move forward and say, how do we uh, ensure that we're being uh, responsible to our climate uh, while ensuring that our residents can eat and feed their children. So, um, well, let's, let's actually, I want to pick up on that, la that your last set of points in our next round, which is talk about what's working. And I love your comment about how all of the, everybody started to work with each other in ways you didn't even imagine and focus on if we're going to do this call to action that Mark asked us to think about, I want to uh, focus each of you on what's working. And Michelle, I want to bring you back. You, uh, USGLC and Cargill are in this innovative project called our Heartland Partnership, where we're engaged all across the Rust Belt and Midwest in conversations. And I've traveled with you and lots of your colleagues where I hear these unbelievable stories about what Cargill is doing around the world that is working. I was with one of your colleagues in North Dakota uh, when we used to travel, and I remember hearing this story about um, a work that you're doing with CARE in something you call She Feeds the World. And, and I, I, you could tell that story or something else, but I, the reason I love that is you're doing good and doing well of empowering women to close the gender gap. And it struck me when Mayor Carter was talking about these innovations. Tell us how these investments are working and what we can learn about them so that we can get to back to getting SDGs on track. Yeah, it's a, it's a really, really good question. And I think um, both mayors hit on this as well. And I, you know, as, as we think about the work that we do in partnership, we have to keep equity and inclusion at the center of what we do. And so, yes, I can talk a bit about our partnership with CARE, but I think it's important to acknowledge here in the Twin Cities, in the state of Minnesota, we have one of the worst opportunity gaps. So as we think about the programs that we're investing around, how do we improve education? How do we improve access to nutrition? We have to have equity and inclusion at the center of those partnerships. And so that's really what, what helps to drive our work. Um, speaking of care, we've worked with care for over 50 years. Um, it's been pretty remarkable. We actually started with them um, when they first began sending care packages to families who had been impacted by war in in Europe. So it's been a long-standing partnership. Since that time, of course, their work and ours has become um, much more complex and we're addressing long-term solutions to addressing food security um, and hunger and agricultural development um, in addition to trying to meet short-term needs. And so you asked about, about the gender piece and we've learned a lot through our work with CARE and we've seen how when you give women opportunities, household incomes rise, productivity increases, children have better access to education and, and, and healthcare. 
Um, and women, especially in low-income countries, have less access to economic assets like financing and land. Um, they produce 50% of the world's food, and yet they own less than 1% of, of the land. I mean, it's, it's just remarkable, the, the inequity that exists. And so through our work with CARE, we've seen that when we give women the same access, we actually see even better results. So for example, the yields are increasing by 20 to 30% along with, with incomes. And then they in turn reinvest those resources into their families. And so you see that long-term sustainable change um, when you invest and you include equity um, and inclusion sort of at, at the center of, of those investments. You mentioned um, She Feeds the World. It's a partnership we have now with CARE that's focused on improving livelihoods, incomes, economic opportunities for 2 million women. And that work is focused in Central America as well as in Africa um, and in, in parts of Asia. And so these, these investments um, are, are yielding great results. We're seeing it over and over and over again. We continue to learn. But I guess one of my calls to action is that as people are thinking about new partnerships and we're thinking about these types of investments, make sure that you're investing um, in a way that's inclusive and equitable and that we're achieving long-term results through these investments. Great, great. Um, Mayor Fry, Minneapolis has no shortages of challenges. We have been watching them all year and been so impressed with your leadership from COVID to the civil unrest. And one of the things I'm impressed is, is you're working with local community organizations to help get make sure the resources get to those who are most in need, most impacted. And the harsh reality is that we all know that those who are most vulnerable are also the most impacted, particularly by COVID-19. So as you think about from the streets of your own home city to those around the world, help us kind of understand this connection between the challenges of inequality and health and food security and what you're doing, what you're seeing that's working, that's driving real positive change. Yeah, it's an excellent question. Uh, you know, I was at an event with Mayor Carter just yesterday, uh, and I'm going to mess up this quote here, but he, he basically said when, you know, uh, America gets the cold, our, our black community gets the flu, or when America gets the cold, those who are of lower income gets, get the flu, and that is most definitely the case, what we're seeing right now. It's, it's, you know, everybody's struggling to a certain extent, but those who feel poverty, those who feel this pandemic more acutely, are those that were already in a difficult place to begin with. And that's why we've seen those lines to food shelf go out the door. Uh, that's why we've seen unsheltered homelessness rise through the roof. That's why, at the end of the day, uh, local leaders, uh, in conjunction with our private and nonprofit teams as well, need to step up to make sure that we're precise with our solutions and that the money that we have, which by the way is limited given the economic realities of the situation, go specifically to those that are struggling the most. And we are in a somewhat precarious food and housing uh, situation right now for so many of our residents. And so we've made sure to set up emergency relief systems. Uh, to provide emergency rental assistance, to get out funds that will help some of these organizations that are providing food or providing shelter, providing that safe, secure, uh, and stable uh, home, uh, making sure that they have the necessary funds and resources they need to do even more work. I mean, and in many cases, they were already burdened to some extent prior to COVID-19. And so they're just gonna have to step up even more. Um, and in March, for instance, as our schools were making some of these hard decisions about when to close schools to help limit the spread of the virus, uh, it became evident that going to school was not just about learning mathematics and, and learning to write. Uh, going to school for so many was also about getting nutrition, and nourishment. Uh, and then suddenly when these two meals a day that they previously in many cases got for free, they now aren't getting, that, per, that now puts a whole new strain on families. It now suddenly they're having to pay for and find food for their children for another two meals a day. And you know, again, in many instances previously, they were only eating those two meals a day and then they were trying to find where and how to eat over the weekend. 
Uh, and so again, like these issues are just becoming more and more stressed. Um, and you know, as, as, as summer now turns into fall, uh, and then as fall turns into winter, that demand has not decreased, but we've actually seen some of these food distribution sites uh, reduce in half from, from June to September. And so those remaining sites are now working to prepare for what could be a prolonged response through this longer storm. So that's all to say, though, there, there is an incredible amount of really amazing work that's happening around food security and food justice that's happening in Minneapolis and St. Paul right now. Uh, and, and that work, it's coming from our food shelves. Uh, it's coming from our, our food banks. It's coming from those who are just steadfastly dedicated um, to doing this work, to working with urban farmers, to working with entrepreneurs and restaurateurs and our faith community. Um, and, and that work's ongoing and undoubtedly it's, it's, it's going to continue. Um, I'll, I'll also note that just over the past uh, year and a half or so, the Minneapolis Food Council has undertaken some really extensive food action planning processes in collaboration with sustainable uh, healthy cities and a number of other organizations. And um, that work started before there was the shortage that we're seeing now, and thank God that it did. Uh, and so right now, we're just got to step up even more because uh, it, it's, it's all, we're in it's even more of, of, of an emergency. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Carter, I, I want to bring in one more issues in terms of what's working, and you've already mentioned it, but I want to give you a chance to talk about it. It's an area you've been a leader in, climate change. The city of St. Paul has been working in partnership with the Great Plains Institute, and you recently, I know, adopted the Climate Action and Resilience Plan. So I wonder if you can, obviously, it's highly connected to the issue we're talking about, food security, and if you can talk a bit about what you see, what you've been doing in developing uh, leadership and public-private sector on this, what uh, you hope that St. Paul can contribute to the movement and obviously so critical right now. Thank you so much. And, you know, we talked about the, the nexus between climate uh, and food. Uh, and one of the pieces is that the problem is so big and so grandiose that oftentimes we feel like whatever we can do at the local level uh, it's, it's limited, right? And it's marginal in, in the context of the global need that we can just see uh, every time we turn on our TV, every time we look around. Uh, but one of the things that we've learned is if uh, we do our part and Minneapolis does their part uh, and, and, you know, uh, Lexington, Kentucky does their part and, you know, we, we sort of kind of put it all together that way, uh, that we can make a profound uh, difference. And I'll tell you right now, in particular in the United States, uh, I'm really impressed uh, and inspired by the way in which in particular mayors and cities and municipalities across the country has st have stepped forward uh, to say, you know, even if we're not going to have the type of action that we all know that we need out of Washington, D.C., uh, we as a country are still going to take action. Uh, climate is one of those things. Mayor Fry and I are two of about 400 mayors across the country uh, that when the president sent, said uh, the United States is going to withdraw from the Paris Climate Accord, said, you know what, uh, we might uh, officially, he can officially withdraw us, but we're going to continue to meet our kind of agreements there. Uh, so for a city like St. Paul, our emissions uh, are oftentimes centered, really centered around buildings and transportation. So those are the two kind of centerpieces of our climate action and resilience plan. Uh, our, our buildings program will both involve a significant amount of public-private partnership uh, with uh, our transportation companies, with uh, car share companies with our energy company here in St. Paul uh, with a broad set of folks. Uh, we're working, we created a, a, a contest called Energize St. Paul. It's the race to reduce. I call it biggest loser for buildings. Uh, and so we've uh, invited and challenged building owners downtown and across our city. Uh, we've got over 200 buildings who have taken us up on this offer uh, to take the challenge to figure out how to reduce their emissions that are coming out of their buildings. Uh, and we have significantly reduced the emissions from buildings. That's frankly, it, that's by the way, an easy public private partnership to craft because the business owners know that it's just, you know, savings for them. It's long-term savings for them. Uh, with regard to our city buildings, uh, we're doing the exact same thing we created in my first year in office, 
a uh, five million dollar internal loan fund to help us uh, upgrade our uh, uh, lighting and you know heating systems and things like that to be more energy efficient. Uh, on the point of savings, those projects, you know, it's a revolving internal loan fund because the projects that we're doing right now will pay off for us. We'll break even on them. Uh, based on the energy savings in just a few years. So we'll be able to recycle those funds and continue to make improvements uh, that are incredibly responsible by our taxpayers because we're just saving money for our community as well. Uh, that's very important. Uh, as we think about um, transportation, uh, it's a perfect space. You know, I, always, uh, I, I, I sometimes joke with folks, uh, you know, we're, we're two cities on the Mississippi River uh, and I sometimes joke with folks that I'm only interested in keeping the St. Paul side of the river clean, not the Minneapolis side. And they always say, well, that doesn't make any sense. And I go, aha, very good point. That doesn't make any sense whatsoever because we're part of a network. And the same as those kind of drops of water in the Mississippi River, our residents, our workforce, our students, all are constantly going back and forth. So the transportation work that we do has to be done regionally. It has to be done in network. It has to be done in partnership uh, or as what Mayor Fry always calls a cooperation uh, that we have uh, between the two cities. So we're working together right now to build a network of charging of electric vehicle charging stations, uh, 70, 70 across the Twin Cities, uh, where you know, we're building out the infrastructure to support people having electric vehicles, whether those are electric bicycles or electric cars, uh, so that they can live in our community. Uh, one important shift right now is we're a majority renter community. And so if you're a renter, uh, if you, unless you are uh, developing a space, unless you're developing, a, uh, um, unless you're renting a, a house that already has an electric charging hub, uh, there's really no way uh, for you to for you to kind of do some of those things for you to have an electric vehicle so we have to have the infrastructure we're doing that in partnership with Minneapolis uh, we in St. Paul are adding uh, 20 miles of bike lanes uh, in 2020 uh, so to make sure that St. Paul is a place uh, that uh, people who can't afford a car can still get around can still get to work or to school again that's being responsible by our environment but it's also being responsible uh, by our uh, residents and ensuring that St. Paul is a place where, you know, people can afford to live and raise their families. Uh, all of those things work together uh, with our food systems because the way we produce and also source our food has everything to do with our responsibility to our environment. Uh, and so, you know, those farmers markets that we were talking about earlier, uh, those, you know, community gardens that we were talking about earlier, uh, help us reduce the amount, uh, the distance that food has to travel to get to our plates. Uh, that's helping our environment as well. So all of these things I think are working well together. I'm really proud of the work that St. Paul has done. Uh, and I'll tell you, very, very appreciative uh, of the fact that we get to do it in uh, partnership and in network uh, with a whole host of cities around our country, our planet, right. uh, including our twin city across the river, Minneapolis. Well, if we can take the twin cities and make people understand that that model is affecting globally, I love it. So let me try to get one more round of questioning in, which I think is ultimately where this conversation could be most useful for our audience. And that's the kind of call to action. And I'm gonna channel one more time, David Beasley for our panelists. Um, who, when, which, when, when he told the Nobel Chant Committee, and I'm going to quote him, is with, with all the wealth in the world today and with all the expertise and technology in the world today, no one in the world should go to bed hungry. You know, no one, we have to do better. And, and that's kind of the theme of what the, the, th the four of us are tasked to do. And luck and me, I don't have to answer it. I just get to ask the question. So, you know, let's think about, it's, April, it's October 16, 2020, but let's think about October 16, 2021. And if the four of us were lucky enough that Mark invites us back a year from now, and we said, what does success look like? Is how do we do better? So Michelle, you get the hard part that you have to start this and the two mayors get to think for a minute, but none of us can go too long because we, we have to end on time. So Michelle, the business roundtable said that businesses have to focus not just on stakeholders, they have to focus on shareholders. Cargill's been doing that a long time. I know that. You just put a million, you know, you just put a lot of money into the World Food Program uh, the day they got the Nobel Peace Prize. So what do businesses and what do we as citizens have to do to do better and get to zero hunger, at least make a movement towards that one year from now? Well, it's quite a challenge. I, but I, and, and I think um, 
Mayor Carter said something too about the individual responsibility that we all have. So St. Paul can make improvements, Minneapolis can too, but we as individuals, I think we all have to be advocates. We have to raise awareness of these issues. We have to engage. Um, Liz, you and I talked about, you know, at least I, right now with, with all that's going on, I'm hoping that one of the outcomes of, of, of this election is that we continue to have strong civic engagement and that we have people engage in understanding the issues before us. I think we also have to help people understand and raise awareness of the important connectivity between international development and the role that that plays and the benefits that that brings right back here at home. And so as we think about where, where consumers are in the future, today 95% of the world's consumers live outside the United States and this is where a lot of the markets are growing. So when you think about opportunities for US farmers and for businesses as well, supporting infrastructure, supporting education, supporting economic development overseas also helps us here in the United States. And the other thing that David Beasley talked a lot about was peace and the important role that peace plays and just reducing conflict. And that we have to work together to find that because that is truly gonna be the end of, of, of hunger. We're not gonna be able to achieve that until we find more, more peace and we have people working together. And the last point I wanna make is about farmers because we can't feed the world without farmers. And so we have to start with agriculture and helping farmers and all along the food system. So we have to help farmers. Cargill provides training for farmers. Um, last year, we trained 860,000 farmers around the world on sustainable agricultural practices. We have to support them um, in, in the food system. And then we have to go across the food system and think about food industry workers. I mean, one of the things that really has struck us during, during COVID is the important role, of course, that food industry workers play. We have to keep them safe. They have a lot of pride. They are feeding the world. And so we have to support them and support the whole system. Cargill's made some investments in helping farmers, but also restaurant workers. We talked about the impact here in the Twin Cities, but that's happening all over. And so we have to think about the investments that we're making to support the food system overall, keeping markets open, advocating right. for trade, et cetera. So those are some of the, those are some of the key things. That, all right, um, you, get, you gave us our call to action in two minutes. That was awesome. Okay. All right, May, Mayor Fry, and Mayor Carter, you both already took action. Um, you joined the board of the Greater Minneapolis-St. Paul Partnership, and today are part of this launch of the new BOLD initiative, MBOLD, the new initiative, that's bringing together Minnesota businesses, researchers, and food and agricultural producers to accelerate solutions to some of these most pressing issues around food and agriculture uh, sectors. So give us a quick update of what this initiative is about, what, what you hope to achieve with it, um, and, and most importantly, what, what can we do? How is it going to impact this economy? Mayor Fry, you're up. Thank you. Uh, well, first, I want to highlight our place in the food economy right now and where we presently are on October 16th, 2020. We have wildfires to our west. We have hurricanes to our east. Uh, and in Minnesota, obviously, we are substantially impacted by global warming. In fact, Minneapolis is the is a city second most impacted by global warming in, in the entire country, the first being New Orleans. Um, but we also have a place in terms of food production. I mean, that, that it's almost in our DNA. Minneapolis was in many ways founded on this principle of, of milling, of grain, uh, and of production of it. Uh, and Embold is, is it, its assertion is that food and agriculture are just such a major asset and a major component of our future. And it's about keeping this region and state on the leading edge that has always been foundational to our city in solving our global challenge and to feed, you know, 9 billion people. So it's, it's about developing these solutions, growing the, the talent base, creating additional jobs in a region, and, and then ultimately improving in, in lives across the, the globe. So that, that's what the work is about. Um, uh, but Right now in 2020, we're also having to think about things differently. We're, all, we're having to make sure that we have immediate access to the food source around our cities. We're having to make sure that, that it's not, we're not relying entirely on oil to get you know, food from point A to point B. We're having to make sure that we're testing soil. Is this a good place to grow? Well, then grow. If this is a bad place to grow, well, then build to make sure that we have almost a green ring around our Twin Cities where we have immediate access to food itself. This sounded like a crazy thing to talk about five or six years ago. Um, and, and remember talking about it then, people would roll their eyes. It's happening now. We need to be concentrated on our access to food. 
And I'll just finish by calling your attention to, to um, you know, talk about the importance of partnerships and specifically corporate, corporate partners. And um, so Larry Fink, look him up. Larry Fink, who's a, a guy, he, he runs, I believe it's called BlackRock, which is one of the main investment firms. I think it's the main investment firm in the entire country. And every year he puts out a letter to all the CEOs around the world saying, hey, we manage you know, assets of however many, I don't know, millions of people. Um, and entities, and we have a fiduciary duty to manage those assets well. And what he said to all these CEOs is more than anything else right now, we need to be t paying attention to climate. Okay. Not because it's just like the right moral thing to do, which it is, but because it's the financially and fiscally smart thing to do, because if we don't, it will have grave economic impacts down the road. So it's the right thing to do. It's the economically sound thing to do. Um, and and you know, it's, I'm glad that the, the Minneapolis and St. Paul are really on the cutting edge of a whole lot of this work. So proud to work with Mayor Carter. Thank you so much, Liz, for all of your work as well. Um, and, and, and Mark and, and Michelle and everyone else. This is a, it's, it's good to have the partnerships. Fantastic. That is very, very exciting what you're doing. Um, uh, Mayor Carter, tell us about um, what is our call to action? Where does MBOLD fit in? to your vision of what we could see as success a year from now? Well, uh, Mayor Fry said it's good to have the partnerships. I'll, I'll go in one more. It's great to have the partnerships. Uh, that's our cooperation in action here. Um, look, we live in a world. Um, we live in a country. We live in a state. We live in a community in which we can still predict the child's expected life outcomes more accurately by her race and her zip code than we can based on her GPA. That is a fundamental statement and it's frankly an indictment of the way we've got our whole system set up. Uh, we know that this pandemic that we're in right now does not fight fair. I heard someone say, and this was a, a heartbreaking statement, that this pandemic, we can look at this pandemic, if, if we didn't listen to any politician's speeches, or if we didn't know any of the founding, founding kind of documentation of the country, that we can look at how this pandemic is behaving and see how our country feels towards communities of color, towards low-income families, uh, towards uh, you know, rural poor families in our community and those types of things. Uh, that's harrowing and that's, uh, that's scary. But one of the things, of all the things that have been clear, I think, in 2020, one of the things that I think is undeniable is that we see right now that as long in our country as literally one family can't afford a safe home to shelter and place in, uh, as long as one family can't afford to take a week off of work to care for a sick child or recover from an illness, uh, as long as one worker uh, can't go to the doctor uh, when they're sick, and I would even go one further and say, as long as uh, people in our community are concerned about their ability, their relationship between law enforcement and community members in our country, uh, that all of us are less safe because of it. What that says to me, and this is our mantra in St. Paul, is no recovery. Uh, we don't want to recover from this crisis uh, because recovery sounds to me like finding a way to get back to where we were uh, six months ago or in some cases, uh, it sounds like folks are talking about six decades ago, trying to get back to where we were before, when the truth is we have to forge forward uh, to a fundamentally new place in our community. We have seen uh, Depression-era hunger, you mentioned that earlier, Depression-era depression era, uh, poverty and unemployment in our community. And the thing I think that makes this fundamentally different in an insulting way, frankly, uh, than that Great Depression is, at the same time, we've seen billionaire wealth grow in America. At the same time, we've seen record-breaking uh, returns on the stock market. And what that says to me is we've got a fundamental split uh, in our economy in which we have our asset-holding class, our asset-owning class, our stock market class, those folks in our community, uh, and the, the well-being of our asset-holding class has divorced itself from the well-being of just everyday Americans in my neighborhood. And so we've centered our, our administration in St. Paul around equity. And the funny thing about equity is sometimes we don't really know what it means. 
Uh, we know we want diverse photographs and we know that we want to feel good about stuff and we know that we want a general sense of fairness, but creating an operationalized definition becomes elusive for us at times. So I go back to my background. I graduated from undergrad, my undergrads in business administration. And for my business school dean, the word equity uh, was very clear uh, and very well defined. It was about ownership. It was about uh, you know uh, ownership and the things that come with ownership, namely uh, both decision, the opportunity to participate in decision-making processes and the opportunity to participate in an economy. And so, you know, like I said, uh, you know, when, when we see billionaire wealth growing, uh, but right. everyday families worried about how to feed their family, uh, it's, cure, it's clear that our ability to participate in our economy uh, is somewhat broken in our country. And in order to fix that, uh, we have to fix uh, everyone, every American's ability to participate in the decision-making processes. That includes the census, that includes election day and voting, but that also includes the city budget, that includes, you know, uh, zoning in our neighborhoods, that includes, uh, you know, conversations about how we source uh, food locally and all of those types of things. So our call to action in St. Paul is to identify new and uh, innovative ways for our community members, especially the ones who we know uh, live in neighborhoods or communities that have traditionally been left behind over and over and over again find new ways to ensure that they are participating in our economy. Because if I have equity in a company, if that company has a good quarter, then I have a good quarter. Uh, our country's economy should be that way. If we have the richest country on the planet, if we want to say that we are the richest society uh, in history, then children shouldn't go to bed hungry at night. Right. Uh, families shouldn't worry about how to, how to pay the rent or keep, how, keep a roof over their head. And so our, our call to action uh, around equity is to find constantly new ways for our families to participate in our uh, citywide, regional, statewide, and national economy. And in order to do that, find new and innovative, innovative ways for people to participate authentically in the decision-making processes which govern our policy and financial decision-making. That's, that's our charge, and that's Great. the charge that I'd sure love to invite everybody to join us in. Well, if uh, Michelle and Mayor Fry come back in so I can just uh, say a big thank you to the three of you for um, enlightening us, giving our call to action, uh, helping close out and figuring how we're going to get to uh, Countdown 2030. So on behalf of everybody, I wish this was a moment where everybody could stand up and give you a standing ovation because that was <laughs> absolutely fabulous and impressive conversation. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for what the mayors for what you're both doing to keep uh, our communities strong and safe. Michelle, what the corporate community and Mark, you are closing out the program. So, baton back to you. <laughs> well, I want to join Thank in that Liz. standing ovation. I want to join in that call for action on equity, on in sustainability, on creating a future. Mayor Carter, Mayor Fry. You know, th this was really a powerful political voice uh, that you've expressed here to give us direction. Michelle, the partnerships that you've been engaged in and the work that you're doing. And Liz, what you've done for 25 years to help us all realize that we need to move and we need to help shape how that political will make some of these things possible and how we have to sometimes get tough when somebody's trying to block or somehow turn us away from our historic leadership role in that global economy. But what we got from this hour now was more direction about that call to action that's come out all during the day about what are we gonna do here now? Uh, we know next year is gonna have a lot more difficulties in some areas globally and locally. We know that, so we have to get in ourselves inspired, charged up, ready to go. But also we've learned to set some guidelines and set some benchmarks and set some goals, some targets. And I'd like to make sure that next year on October 16th, 2021, all of us get back together and we're able to say, this is what we set, set out to do. This is what we were able to do. Disappointments, successes we didn't know but we would have the opportunity to say, as a people, we came together. As a people, we found a way to move forward on one, if not all, of the sustainable goals that we have 
because we're thinking about our children and we're thinking about that next generation. Out at the Mall of America, there's a big display that Global Minnesota was able to put up this week in partnership with the mall. And it's letters from the children of Belgium. 100 years ago, they wrote to the children of America for saving their lives because America was able, largely from our region, to feed Europe. In that moment, Belgium, which was occupied and people were starving, and then all of Europe. But the idea that children can understand that connectivity on the planet and can express gratitude with the kind of clarity and language, it will, it will open your heart, it will make you cry, it will make you understand that Minnesota's relationship to the world and the world's relationship to Minnesota has all kinds of components. But at the end of the day, there's matters of the heart and matters of the soul and the spirit so if you're out there and you really want to see one way that we make that global local connection up on the third floor at the mall, on the north end, up by the food court, beautiful, beautiful, big display on the wall. But it will remind you that we have a historic role to play. This afternoon, we were reminded that we've got a long ways to go. And today, Liz, you gave us the coda, the closed that gave us the inspiration to know that we can do this as long as we stay true to the values, the vision, and that commitment to what the future generations are able to say they have. General Eisenhower is kind of famous for being quoted sitting there on D-Day Beach 20 years after Walter Cronkite, Cronkite and he said, you know, these graves, these young men bought us time to see if we can do it better. And I have to say, we've been challenged, but others have been challenged. They bought us sometimes. We need to tackle these big issues so that one year from now we can say, yes, we are in a countdown to 2030. We are moving ahead because we're people of action. It won't be a simple path. It won't be a straight path, but we are in it together. This afternoon, you gave us the opportunity to close out this day of deep emotion and incredible big thinking and all kinds of things. We had a, an analogy early on. Adi from the Native American Development Institute talked about having a door open that then allowed us in to learn and to relate and to share. Today was a door opening. This last panel opened that door wide and you welcomed us in. We all have that opportunity. We'll all keep working together and I plan on making sure that a year from now, we have an opportunity to come back together, see how we're doing and to rededicate ourselves again. Thank you to all and thank you to everyone watching and to our members. Thank you so much for making this kind of program possible. And for anyone else who would like to join and be part of that process, yes, it's being matched. That's a good thing. But if you'd like to keep up with Global Minnesota and no more, just go to the website and click on it. And don't forget 530 social hours, lots of exciting things. So thank you again. Thank you again for being honest. There's a way to keep that conversation going and again. Liz, Mayor Carter, Mayor Fry, Michelle Roth, thank you so much and good day.